Hello knitters, Barbara Benson here. I am an independent knitwear designer who also likes to make videos here on my YouTube channel, Watch Barbara Knit. Please make sure to check in the description notes below the video where you will find links to all of my online shenanigans, including how to get my patterns to knit up for yourself, how to join the Watch Barbara Knit Facebook group, how to support me on Patreon, and where to get Watch Barbara Knit t-shirts and things like that, and links to anything that I refer to in this video. So one of my more recent videos was talking about substituting cast-ons because of a question and that got me thinking about substituting things. And then uh, I got another question in a comment on one of my shawl tutorials where it's just like a very short tutorial on how to knit a specific shawl. It's a free pattern kind of situation. And the increases I used in that were yarn over and someone said they did not like the holes, the look of the holes, and were wondering if they could just substitute another increase. And so I was like, hey, how about a video talking about what you need to think about when you are substituting increases? There are not going to be any like increased tutorials in this video, but I will link in the description notes. I will go through the 500 some odd videos that I have on my channel and find all the ones that are tutorials on how to do different increases. And I will put those in the description notes. I definitely know I have one on a yarn over. I definitely know I have one on make one left, make one right. I don't know if I have one on knit front back. If I don't have one on knit front back, then I'll probably make one in the near future. Maybe a short video, you know, those vertical ones that I only have a minute. So I don't make many of them because y'all know I, I, I talk. <laughs> I talk a lot. Uh, so when you are considering contemplating customizing your pattern that you have by substituting an increase, maybe it's because you don't like the look of it. Maybe you don't like the way you have to execute a specific increase because I'm with you there. Some of them are just flat out annoying. Maybe it's, it's for whatever reason, you don't like the increase that the pattern calls for and you want to use a different increase. And before you make a substitution, I would like to encourage you to think about three things that you need to think about. You need to think about the visual appearance of the increase and how that is going to affect the final piece. Uh, as the original commenter didn't like the holes, uh, so they wanted them to go bye-bye. <laughs> so that is, it's the aesthetics of it. But you would want to think about and look at all of the photographs of the piece and try to decide how integral to the piece, the f like overall appearance of the piece, the overall appearance of the increases might be. So that is something you have to think about. You have to think about how substituting the increase is going to affect the like physical drape of the piece. And again, we're going to get, um, these are just like the, I'm going over them with a broad brush and then we're going to talk deeper, but different increases and decrease. We're not talking about decreases, Barbara, <laughs> but it's true. Different increases affect the flow and the drape of the fabric in different ways. And then the third, and as far as I'm concerned, quite possibly the most important element you need to consider is the actual like physical architecture of the stitch itself. And by that, I mean, does the increase consume a stitch in its execution? And I'm going to let that sit with you for a moment because you might be like, what do you mean, <laughs> Barbara? What do you mean? And, and we'll get there. There are all different kinds of increases, uh, it, hundreds probably. But one thing that you can say, I 
think you can safely say is that one way to break down increases into two categories is does this increase consume a stitch or does it make a stitch just sort of magically appear? <laughs> okay. The number one stitch increase that consumes a stitch is knit front back. And knit front back, you are literally looking at the next stitch on your needle, knitting into the front loop, leaving that stitch on your needle, and then knitting into the back loop, eventually slipping that off. So you've turned that one stitch into two stitches. But in doing so, you have consumed that stitch. You've used a stitch. Now, there are other types of increases that involve, I think one's called the bunny ear, that in, involve like reaching into like the one below it and pulling it up and knitting it together. I mean, there's all different kinds. But when you look at the increase that is called for in your pattern, you need to determine if it consumes a stitch, okay? Because if it consumes a stitch, or even if it doesn't consume a stitch, if you're substituting, you need to take that into consideration. Now, increases that don't consume a stitch, easiest one right off the top of my head is a yarn over. That is, you are knit, you are working a stitch. It could be a knit, it could be a purl, it could be a decrease, but you are working a stitch, you place the yarn over your needle, and then you work the next stitch. And you have literally made a stitch appear between two columns of stitches where there wasn't a stitch before. It leaves a hole. That's visual appearance. It leaves a hole, okay? But it doesn't consume a stitch. Uh, make one left, make one, make one left, make one right. Also fall into the doesn't consume a stitch category because you are actually lifting the bar in between the two stitches. So you have a column and a column. And so you work a stitch and then you lift the bar in between that and the next stitch, create your stitch using that bar and then work your next stitch. Again, you have made it up here. This is where we get into drape. Even though both yarn over and a make one, make one left or make one right, do not consume a stitch, they impact the drape much differently. Because a yarn over, you're actually using the new working yarn to completely make that new stitch and it leaves a hole. With a make one, because you are lifting that bar, lifting that bar takes yarn from the stitch in front and the stitch after it and tightens everything down. So a make one, and then you knit through it and that working yarn makes the new stitch, but you've tightened ever so slightly the two stitches on either side by lifting that bar and that affects the drape. Using a yarn over is going to give you a much drapier effect and using the make one is going to tighten everything just just a little bit. So you need to take that into consideration. So that's why I was saying, so I'm hitting all three points. Why whether or not a stitch is consumed is important has to do with the actual instructions in the pattern. Because if your pattern, and we're just gonna make it up off the top of my head, says knit five, yarn over, knit five, okay? And you're like, I don't like yarn overs, I'm just gonna substitute knit front back. And you knit five, knit front back, and then knit five, you're using an extra stitch, okay? Because if, it, if you only have 10 stitches, it would be immediately obvious. You would knit five, knit front back, and then you would only have four stitches left. And you'd be like, I only have four stitches left because that knit front back consumed the stitch. Whereas if it was knit five yarn over knit five, 
it's not going to consume that stitch. And so you have five and five. But that's only like immediately obvious if you only have 10 stitches. If you are doing knit five, yarn over, knit five, some other stitch, knit five, yarn over, like if it's in a repeat, what's going to happen is you're going to knit five, knit front back, knit five, some other stitch, knit five, knit front back, knit five. And depending on how many knit front backs you do in that substitution, by the time you get to end of that row or the end of that round, you are going to be four, five, six, seven, ten stitches short and everything is going to be shifting because it's not going to work outright. So either you need to compensate for that, which you would need to rewrite your pattern to say knit five, knit front back, knit four, right? And you can do that. Um, but it's still not going to be exact because knit five yarn over knit five, you're going to have it, that increase is going to be completely centered between those five stitches. Whereas if you're doing the knit front back here, it's, it's going to be a little bit off, but it is doable. You just have to make sure you think about it. And the same thing would work that if the original instructions were knit five, knit front back, knit five, that actually takes up 11 stitches. And if you knit five yarn over knit five, by the end of the row, you would have like eight, nine, 10 extra stitches because you weren't consuming that stitch. And again, everything's gonna be off. This is a particularly gonna be particularly bad if you're doing some sort of lace pattern. Is it's gonna make it this is gonna make it yucky. So that is why it's really important to know whether or not the increase you are using consumes a stitch. I'm not saying you can't substitute a consumptive stitch for a non-consumptive stitch. Um, wow, it's <laughs> that sounds like I'm talking about, it's like a Victorian stitch, it has consumption. Um, <laughs> but um, you can do it, you just need to know and you need to compensate in your pattern for what you are changing. Uh, the specific example of the individual who wanted to uh, change, the only yarn overs she was looking at in the shawl were actually the selvage. They were the increases that created the shape of the shawl. So it was like knit two, yarn over, work to the last two stitches, yarn over, knit two. Simple enough. Um, and since the, if there's a pattern in between, if you want to do knit two, knit front back, knit to the last two stitches, knit front back, you could do it, but it is gonna affect the stitch pattern that's in the center part, because again, you're consuming those stitches. Uh, the easiest thing to do in that context, if it isn't that you don't like working yarn overs, you just don't like the look of the whole, the easiest way to overcome that in any pattern that calls for a yarn over is actually to address it on the wrong side. When you uh, make those yarn overs that you don't like, when you are coming back on the wrong side, whether you're knitting or you're purling, work that yarn over through the back loop. When you work that yarn over through the back loop, it twists it and it closes it down and the, the hole is not going to be particularly visible. It's going to be very similar to doing a make one left or a make one right. Uh, I do want to mention that make one by itself does leave a hole, but it leaves a smaller hole than a yarn over, but you can't close it down by knitting through the back or working through the back loop because the hole is from the row below because you're lifting that bar. Okay, so I hope that I covered and didn't make it too confusing how the different um, increases affect, oh, you know what? Something to talk about visually, make one right, make one left. The reason why make one there's a make one right and a make one left is because they 
tilt. Again, I will link to the video on make one right, one make one left. The increases actually tilt. You get a twisted when you lift the bar. You either knit through the back or you need. There's it's very specific, but you end up with this little twisted bar and that's what closes it up and one very distinctly leans left and one very distinctly leans right i and i just made the gesture with the wrong hand <laughs> that was very strange i don't know why i did that uh so <laughs> what you have is when you use the make one left and make one right it actually sets up that column to be going at a slight angle. Now, if you're just putting it in and then you're not continuing to do it like in like down a spine, it's not really going to be at an angle. But like if you're doing it in a shawl and it's like a center spine that make one right and make one left is going to angle those stitches and create columns that are going at an angle like this. And if you go in and substitute a yarn over, it's going to pull that in. It's not going to be as distinct. So if it's important to the design, you might want to consider that and do what I said about making the yarn over, but then on the wrong side, working it through the back loop. And that'll just close it down and it leaves that extra yarn in there, but you might need it. So you just need to think about how it's going to affect, how it's going to look. And that's another thing. There are some patterns, especially when you're getting into garment patterns, where the increase has been very specifically selected by the designer to be as invisible as possible. Knit front back is kind of visible in that what you end up with is a knit stitch that looks like normal but then when you knit back you get like a little tiny bar that almost looks like a purl stitch which frankly knit front back works beautifully in seed stitch because you already have that kind of knit one purl one pattern going on and it, it works fine in uh, texture patterns but if you are working straight up stockinette and you want your stockinette to lose look as smooth as possible uh, knit front back is maybe not your best choice because you will get those little visible bumps. And that is where uh, a lot of designers go to fairly extensive links to work and research and develop invisible increases. So if you are looking at the pattern that you're considering and it has some like particularly finicky or particularly finesse increase that you've never heard of, look at where those increasers are laying and think that it might be they're, they're trying to be invisible, <laughs> that they're trying to not be seen. So I think that covers it. We're talking about substituting can change the drape what we talked about, about yarn overs versus knit front back versus make ones, um, can change the visual appearance and it can change the pattern itself. I have every faith that every one of you can figure this out. And I want to encourage people to modify patterns so that they work for their own wants, needs, and desires. That's why I make these videos. I am not making this video and trying to discourage you from substituting. I'm trying to give you the, the puzzle pieces that you need to create your own pattern or modify an existing pattern to fit your own like agenda, <laughs> okay? Because I fully support, and that's why I called the one, be the boss of your knitting. You can do this once you have enough information. I feel like when people try to make these changes and they don't work out particularly well, it's just because they didn't even know what questions to ask. And that is not their fault. It's not their fault that they don't have this in-depth knowledge because it, I don't, I don't know how to fix my car. I drive it. I'm a very good driver, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I don't know how to like fix my air conditioning if it goes bad, but I know how to turn it on. You don't have, unless it's like your job to know the nitty gritty of something, there's no reason for you to really know these in-depth things. But that means I'm not going to go out and like 
pop the hood of my car and start poking at things because I don't know what I'm doing. But if you know what questions to ask and you know what little doohickey to look for, I mean, I can find the little oil dipstick, you know, just enough to be dangerous. And I want y'all to be dangerous knitters. So if you like this video, please give it the thumbs up, click that like button. And if you would like to be notified whenever I upload any new videos, please subscribe to my channel and select notifications. Thank you so much.